he goes live. So just wait a few seconds so that it goes live. Okay, I think you're good. Brandon, okay? Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the June, uh, January 4th, 2023 Land Use Committee meeting of Community Board 1, Queens. My name is Elizabeth Arian. I am co-chair with Jerry Caliendo of the um, committee. Uh, also here tonight is Jeffrey Martin, who is vice chair, and of course, our com most of our committee members. Um, I just want to inform anybody using the chat and also the participants and attendees that this is a live meeting. It is being recorded and will be available for viewing on YouTube, um, probably by tomorrow. The, um, let's see what else. Um, okay, I guess we can go to the first. Um, we have two presentations tonight. One is an uh, item we saw just last month, the BQE West rezoning, um, which was certified right after we had the presentation. So they are back here to um, talk about some parent changes they have made to the proposal. And also um, at the end of the meeting, we during our business section, we will be voting on a recommendation to the community board on this rezoning request. The com community board will be holding its hearing January 17th on this project. So the second and the second application, a second item on the agenda is um, an a proposal by the Long Island City Partnership to expand its bid boundaries. And we'll hear about that afterwards. So we'll go to the first item. And I believe the first person to will be Frank St. Jacques. Um, am I correct? That, that's correct. Thank you. Um, so I, I'll, I have a, a brief presentation. Um, uh, hi, everyone. My, my name is Frank St. Jacques. I'm with, with Ackerman. We're, we're land use council uh, for this this project. I'm, I'm here tonight um, with, with the owners and applicant uh, for, for this project, uh, Sal and, and Phil, um, and also with Lauren George from Constantinople and Valone, who's, who's helping with um, uh, government relations. Um, I'll go ahead and, and, and run through uh, our presentation and then Sal and Phil um, can provide a little bit more color on um, on the application and, and the, the changes that, that you alluded to, Liz. Um, when we presented back in, in December, um, we had discussed uh, this proposed rezoning facilitating uh, ground up development of a new industrial building. Um, since that time, um, the owners have, have sort of rethought their business plan and with, with respect to the new ground up development and are, are actually seeking to um, achieve uh, or use the rezoning to, to facilitate um, an enlargement of the existing gym that, that's at the site. Um, so we'll walk you through some of the thinking there, but I'll, I'll run through the presentation um, and then you know, turn it over to Sal and Phil to, to talk about um, the, the gym and, and their decision to, to, to make that change. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen, if you bear with me one moment. And if I could just get a thumbs up that, that you guys can see my screen. Okay, great. So um, the action sought is a um, zoning map amendment. It's to change an existing M11 zoning district uh, to an M12 zoning district. And this is an area that's, that's generally bounded by uh, Belove Avenue to the north, 27th Avenue to the south, uh, Borough Place to the west and, and the BQE West uh, to the east. Um, and the, uh, this action um, is proposed to facilitate the redevelopment um, of the site, which is, is outlined in red, whereas the entire uh, rezoning area that includes a, a portion that's, that's not applicant controlled uh, is, is shaded red here. Um, the land use rationale for, for this rezoning um, is remains uh, with, with the proposed change to the, the project itself 
it's really um, that the M12 remains consistent with the surrounding industrial character uh, and would promote economic development with the redevelopment of, of this site and associated job creation with the expansion of uh, the existing gym at, at the site. So um, these next few slides go over the existing zoning and its context. This will be familiar um, from the, the presentation I, I, we uh, uh, gave last month. Um, but again, the site was zoned uh, with M11 zoning back in 1961 uh, and hasn't changed since that time. Uh, so it's, it's a few decades on. Um, and this M11 is, is uh, generally mapped along the rail tracks to the west and St. Michael Cemetery uh, to the east with the BQE running through the center, as you can see in um, the circle area uh, on, on the zoning map. Um, it's isolated from surrounding residential areas to the east and west um, because of, of the uh, St. Michael Cemetery and the railroad tracks. Um, and the, this uh, M11 is, is, is uh, you know, really relatively large M11 that's um, zoning district that's generally extends from Western Queens and follows the rail lines um, uh, northward to Astoria Boulevard uh, and Grand Central Parkway north of the project area, which if you can see my cursor, cursor is, is just north of uh, the proposed project area. Um, in this aerial view, uh, this and, and the next uh, few slides uh, show this, this industrial context, um, essentially of a, a strip of M11 zoned land where the uses are um, and built environment are consistent with, with that zoning. Uh, it's predominantly conforming uh, industrial commercial um, uses consistent with, with zoning. Now, this is not an industrial business zone, um, but there, there are uh, you know, a variety of, of different uh, types of, of industrial and commercial businesses, uh, both in, in smaller uh, multi-tenant buildings uh, and then on larger sites and, and larger buildings. Um, these uh, uses include um, supply and contracting businesses, distribution, fabrication. Um, there's also a U-Haul facility uh, directly across the BQE from the site, which you can see here in this photo, uh, an Amazon distribution center, the TLC inspection station, uh, and a, a large storage facility. Um, these are all on, on large sites with, with open areas uh, for vehicle use. Um, but as you can see from, from the photo, there's, there's really a variety of building typologies and businesses located uh, in this, this M11 zoned area. So just a, a different view of that context and showing the, um, uh, just the site, not, not the entire rezoning area uh, outlined in red and uh, shaded. Uh, in red as well. So the development site is a single tax lot. Uh, it's about 43,000 square feet, uh, 43,515 uh, square feet um, to be exact. It's, it's irregularly shaped. It has about 315 feet of frontage on Borough Place and about 257 feet of frontage on the BQE West. So it's essentially a, a long, uh, relatively uh, thin lot. Uh, and it's improved with a 35 uh, foot tall building, which you can see here on these photos that was constructed back in the 60s, originally used for, for manufacturing uh, and has is, is changed um, uh, since that time. And in 1979, um, the first uh, gym use was established there um, originally as, a, as a, ten a tennis center, which expanded and then through different ownership over the years, um, is now ultimately the, the BQE Fitness, um, which is, is now owned by the applicants uh, who, who are at the meeting tonight. Um, the other use uh, at the site is the New York City Gentlemen's Club. Um, it's a, uh, a eating and drinking establishment um, that is, you can see on, on the upper right hand side of the screen. So the action we're seeking is a zoning map amendment uh, that would change the existing M11 to an M12. Uh, and I'll describe that and then the, the proposed um, redevelopment of the site. So the development site and uh, the adjacent lot to the south, which is about a 7,466 7, square foot lot 
that has an auto body shop on it that's not controlled by the applicant. Um, overall, it's, it's just shy of 51,000 square feet in total to be rezoned. Um, this would change from an M11 to an M12 were the zoning to be approved. Um, and really the significant change between uh, M11 and M12, they allow the same range of uses. Um, they have the same uh, uh, bulk and parking requirements, or excuse me, mostly the same bulk and parking requirements, uh, but for the floor area ratio of M11 is a 1.0 or one times the lot area. And the floor area ratio or FAR of the M12 is, is doubled, it's two. Um, so what this uh, zoning change would effectively do is allow um, a, a doubling of floor area available on a zoning lot included uh, within the proposed rezoning area, um, which is, is um, ultimately why it's being sought here. Um, this uh, area map just um, uh, reinforces the, the point earlier about the, the commercial and uh, industrial nature of the, uh, of the surrounding area, and then also shows the zoning district boundary with both the development site uh, and the non-applicant owned site that, that's also within uh, the, the zoning area, um, essentially to stretch the M12 um, from about mid block to down to 27th. So what's being proposed? Um, again, initially we, we discussed um, a, a ground up redevelopment of the site um, which would have displaced the existing uh, gym business that, that's now owned by um, the applicants. Um, the plan now is to um, continue to seek the M12 zoning, which would unlock uh, additional floor area at the site, um, approximately 45,000 additional square feet of floor area, sorry, roughly 43,000 square feet of additional floor area. Um, in order to bring the uh, existing gym business from about 30,000 square feet to about 60,000 square feet. So the, um, the, the project would not uh, max out the available floor area. It would, it would fall short of the 2.0 uh, that's permitted, um, falling roughly at about um, 1.4, 1.5 FAR. Um, but this would allow uh, the BQE Fitness to uh, expand within uh, the, the vacant space within the building, um, including the, the um, gentleman's club, um, and also reestablish mezzanines that, that were re removed within the building um, and increase the, um, and, and allow a, a vertical and horizontal enlargement onto the parking lot area at the south of the site. Um, more parking would, would be required for enlarged square footage and that would be provided on site. Uh, but what this would do would, would allow uh, additional programming space, uh, particularly for uh, courts, which um, BQE Fitness is, is able to provide now because it's, it's such a large facility, uh, but they, um, are, you know, th those, those courts are, take up a lot of space. Um, so they're hoping to expand into the parking lot um, in, in order to, to provide more courts. Um, this will also allow uh, BQE Fitness to uh, approximately double uh, their 55 current employees uh, to over 100. Um, again, provide uh, parking, um, that programming and amenity space, and really continue to operate um, this facility as a community fit fitness resource that's, that's been there for, for decades, since about 1979. Um, I have one more slide and then I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Phil and Sal to, to give it a little bit more color here. Um, one of the compelling reasons that, that you know, led them to you know, sort of rethink uh, the either closure or, or displacement of the gym um, during their, their thoughts or during the uh, construction period for the, the new building was that there's several organizations that rely on, on BQE Fitness um, for space. Uh, so several are listed here, but these include um, camps and uh, um, educational institutions um, and, and uh, youth programs, sports programs um, that rely on the facilities to, for their programming. Uh, some of which are, are provided at, at reduced rates um, as, as nonprofits. So I will turn it over to Phil and Sal uh, to introduce themselves 
Um, just to give a little bit more context on, on what the thinking is here, we recognize that it's, it's um, you know, not the typical course of business to, to change course in a rezoning, uh, sort of, we're not even midstream, we're, we're very much at the beginning, but um, just they, they, can, they can give you a little bit more color on that. And then obviously we're, we're all here, happy to answer questions. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sal Lucchese. Um, my partner, Philip Loria, is also on this. Um, look, we are local small business owners uh, from, you know, we weren't in on the first call, so just to fill you in a little bit. Born and raised in the area, um, in Astoria particularly. We work here every day. Um, and as, as uh, Frank explained, there has been a, a slight change, and that's because for us, the, the, you know, in the last 30 days, it's been uh, quite a whirlwind. We've had uh, basically two years of radio silence on this rezoning, which we're new to. So uh, apparently that's the going timeline. But in the last 30 days, a lot, a lot has happened and it's happened very quickly. Um, during that time, uh, during the last two years, a lot has changed for us, uh, you know, particularly for the gym. We, during the pandemic, we, we took over the gym and... Um, you know, in the, in the last 30 days since the, the, the pre-approval process, it, everything became very real to us. Um, we, we've had some serious internal discussions with our partners, our you know, employees, our, our members, what we consider the, the BQE family. And um, all th although light manufacturing has, is a, a viable option, ultimately expanding the, the the gym is the better option and the better route, um, the, the better use of the rezoning uh, FAR. Um, we've realized, you know, more and more since we've been operating this gym um, that the community has a real void in it. And, and that void is the lack of indoor recreational space. As I'm sure you all know, the sports, sports complex was bought and closed down. Um, that's the, the only space. And, and you know, for us, we, we're, we're fully occupied on, on those courts and the gym and everything all the time. We provide uh, us quite the service to the, to the community and we want to continue to do, do so. Um, and an expansion would greatly help that and, and, and help the community. Um, we currently service 6,500 members and, and thousands more that use the courts yearly. Uh, you know, some of the people that we service were Vaughn College's official fitness center and training facility. I mean, they're a college, they have no space. Think about that. We, we host a ton, we, a ton of grammar schools, community organizations, Nike, Just Play, a, a variety of places. We host children's volleyball, basketball, soccer on a daily basis. Those are the type of things we want to expand on. Those are the type of things that are, we, we've really come to realize are, are needed in the community. And um, that, that's why we ultimately came to the decision that we came to over the last, you know, 30 days or so. Um, adding to what Sal said and um, a little bit about us. Um, so being a part of the Woodside community and story and the neighboring is we, we live it, we feel it, and we understand it. And anytime we do want to take a project, we take pride in meeting the people, understanding what they want and filling a void in the market and Every day, you know, we look back from when we took over the BQE and where we are today, and you just start to see how much the place is loved uh, by the members. And what we initially thought was going to be a gym operation turned into basically the community country club. So this is not only a, a place where people work out, but it's a place where the community congregates. They talk, they come with their family. They, they eat, they have dinner, they play sports, uh, they, they get thoughts off their mind, they meet people. So it's, it, it's one of those special things that we were able to play a, a role in and that has resonated with the community. And I think that's why the, our membership has grown so fast and 
when you really look back and reflect and you say, hey, you know what? What's the right thing to do? Um, what's the prudent thing to do to, for the community and what's the better choice? Um, I, I think, you know, Sal and I and, and our partners and everybody that we've spoken to, I think we've been unanimous in that expanding the gym is, is, is the right thing to do. Um, and in, in going with the expansion route as opposed to a new redevelopment, um, you're not displacing 6,500 people that have made this part of their lives. Um, so that's why um, you know, tough decision, but we're confident that it's the right decision and what's right. And that's why we changed. When we started this process, like we said, over two years ago, um, that's before we, we took over the gym, never in a million years did we think that this was the avenue, you know, the, that, that we'd be led into. It, it just wasn't even a thought. And over the last two years, right, that we took it over in, in November, you know, we, we thought we'd still be able to facilitate it and twist and turn. And, you know, like like I said, it was, it was nothing happened for two years, so it wasn't really a thought. And then when everything materialized in the beginning of December, I believe it was, um, it, it really, we, we had a lot of, put, we put a lot of serious, serious thought into it. And that's why we, we are where we are today. So I think with, with that, um, you know, re recognizing that this, you know, probably creates a lot of questions, we're, we're happy to, um, you know, field those if, if there's any, um, you know, I'm happy to pull up any of the, the um, parts of the presentation or um, any other materials you, you may need, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll close our, our presentation and, and um, be happy to answer any questions. I was having a problem unmuting, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, yeah, it does raise a lot of questions. Um, it's a whole different use you're talking about. So um, uh, one thing that I, I mean, as a person who lives in the area, I would never think of going to your gym, um, becoming, and now I find it is membership. So those are questions I'm sure some of the other board uh, committee members will ask. But I, I you know, it, it never came, it never crossed my mind. I never heard about all of the things that you do for the community before, which caught me all by surprise when you talked about expanding the gym. So, um, you know, I just, we, we know about the problems we had with the gentlemen's club there. So, you know, the thing that I thought about was, is there a possibility that this club is going to be using it in conjunction with an expanded gym, et cetera? These are things that will come up also in the community. So, um, but I'm going to open it up first. You know, you can address this as you go along. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Frank, Madam Chair. Uh, um, Elizabeth, just responding to your question, um, and, and maybe Sal and I should have uh, elaborated on it. Um, the gentlemen's club is, is not part of the plan. They will be completely eliminated. And one thing that um, Sal and I have is that anybody at any time unannounced, you're welcome to visit the establishment and see it with your own eyes. Um, we're open from five in the morning to 11 at night. Um, like I said, you're welcome to visit, announced, unannounced, it makes no difference to us. We're proud of what we do. And we're confident that once you visit the establishment and you see the love and the improvements that we've made to it, 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 it'll surely resonate with you and you'll probably want to be part of our family also. Okay. Madam Chair, through the chair, yeah. um, we have no historical problems with that gentleman's club. Actually, that gentleman's club was pretty much run exemplary for that type of an establishment. They pretty much ran a very clean business without any real noted troubles. So that, yeah. that location never had a problem. And this health club has been doing children's birthday parties and things of that sort for numerous years. I could go back 30 years where they did birthday parties. Okay. There's, there's uh, a of really great commercials on YouTube from, from the 80s uh, for, for the, the establishment from, from 1979 on. So there, there's a real, and, and sorry, I'm, I'm, you know, this is a, 
an aside, but there, there's a real history of, of this gym being in the neighborhood and that's what informed their decision to, you know, rather than displace it, you know, try and expand what's there. Okay, thank you. Um, one, one business note, I'm gonna ask the committee members if they could at all possibly open their screens so that we can see you participating. Um, I'm gonna to go to, thank you very much. I'm going to go to um, uh, Richard, he has his hand up. Hello, um, number one, I know the gym well. Back in the 80s, I used to go to that gym um, because in the old days I used to work in uh, nights and clubs and it was the only place that was really open at five in the morning or four in the morning when we used to go there. It was quite a group of nurses and policemen which is what we saw a lot of. Anyways, is there any thought towards going back to 24 hours? Because it was historically 24 hours for a long time. At, the, at, just, at this gesture, we're, we're happy with the hours. Um, I don't mm -hmm. see it going to 24 hours. <clears throat> okay. We currently, and, we currently go 5 a.m. to 11. It, you tend to uh, be okay with that time frame. The 24 hour sometimes brings a different crowd as well. So you never know, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a harder bit. It's a large facility. You need to staff it fully. It, it, it's a harder run at, uh, at that time. Yeah, I know I was part of that different crowd. <laughs> 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 Anyways, uh, also uh, the permitting process, maybe uh, Frank, you would know whether that because a physical establishment needs a specific permit. Um, will they in fact have to uh, um, so change it or that's or a good question and uh, you know what what's interesting is is the facility at the site predates the um board of standards and appeals um what was what used to be known as is the physical culture establishment uh, mm -hmm. special permit that in, in a citywide zoning change that uh requirement for a, a special permit was was eliminated last oh, year okay. Um, and, and there's a new zoning designation, a health or fitness establishment. Mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to sort of figure out whether or not, um, there, there is a CO for the existing facility um, mm -hmm. as, as a, um, that, that precursor to the physical culture establishment. We're mm -hmm. trying to figure out if an enlargement would um, also fit under that, that, that uh, prior um, zoning designation or the entire enlarged site would be a health or fitness establishment. And that's something that, that we'd need to dig into a little bit further, probably with the Department of Buildings and potentially with, with DCP. So to answer your question, I'm not sure, but we would not need any sort of further discretionary action, for example, from the Board of Standards and Appeals. This, this would be an as of right, assuming that, that the additional floor area were unlocked pursuant to the rezoning. They also, uh, you mentioned additional parking. Do you have an idea of the configuration now? I know that the, the it's not really specifically required. We're just looking at changing the zoning here. But how will the envelope change? Uh, how much more parking are we talking about? Uh, what do you, what can you tell us actually about what the projected scope of this whole project will be now? So the. Um... Right, just based on on preliminary calculations, um, mm -hmm. so what what's being contemplated in terms of um, th the this would be a phased project, wherein um, as the gentleman's club tenant is is vacated, that space could be taken over. Um, basically, any any unutilized space within the footprint of the existing building would mm -hmm. be taken up, achieving. Um, you know, a, 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 one, a full 1.0 FAR of, of gym space. Mm -hmm. Then there's also opportunity to, there, there were several mezzanines that had been added uh, and then taken down um, that were non-compliant. There's opportunity because it's a big A-frame building to create more mezzanine space and work within the structure of the existing building. Um, mm -hmm. the, the sort of a final phase would be um, to where the parking lot is, there's a certain an unenclosed surface parking lot at the south edge of the site um, would be to dig down um, to provide uh, um, seller parking uh, and then grade parking and then probably like two levels of um, uh, expanded gym space at that southern end. So that's, that's roughly... Um, 
we're, I think our initial um, calculations are about 80 or so spaces uh, there um, to accommodate you know, what, what the perceived demand is and also meet the, the parking requirement. This is a little bit loose because the, um, you know, the, there's not a, a um, specific plan that's, that's been designed by the architect. It's, that's something that, that's, that's being worked on now. Um, but the, because the M12 um, does come with a parking requirement, the, the amount of expansion space is gonna be couched by um, ensuring there's sufficient parking to, to meet the requirement. So I, I know that's a sort of involved question, answer to a, a relatively easy question, but um, we're, we're looking at approximately the same amount of parking um, because the, the demand, um, the amount of parking that's there meets the demand and most of the space that's added is gonna be in the form of courts. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily um, space that, that would necessitate, uh, you know, more, more parking spaces. Um, also note that the, um, and, and Sal and Phil can tell you a little bit more about this, but it, um, you know, alternate non-driving modes of, of transportation are encouraged uh, mm -hmm. for the members. So, you know, bikes um, and, and a lot of folks, you know, walk and, and jog into the gym. So, um, we're dialing in on that, but you know we'll meet the parking requirement and probably have a little less floor area. That's how we arrived at about 1.5 FAR versus two. Uh, lastly, the courts themselves. Um, I know that in the last discussions that we had in the past with Astoria Sports Complex, uh, the owner there was looking towards establishing some small soccer uh, facility within his establishment. And now there was always talk about hockey rink and that, things like that. Are those things, type of things being con contemplated or are the courts just basically uh, handball, tennis, uh, basketball? Is that? There'll be uh, multifunctional basketball, volleyball, soccer. That mm -hmm. seems to be oh, the okay. key need. Probably uh, some pickleball or some tennis. Things that, they, all the courts will be multifunctional, as is our current court now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, and and I can I can pull the, the pictures back up, but you know essentially, um, you know I, I think our, our photos show, um, you know basketball, volleyball, and yoga all happening on, on the same space. So um, to to that point, there's you know a variety of, of different programming that can be done there. Okay. All right. Thanks. I'm good. Thank you, Richard. Um, so basically what we're doing is really looking at, in a sense, at whether or not this is an appropriate use and whether or not the doubled floor area is going to be used well within that use. Um, we're not anticipating any more any industrial uses in that on that site. No. So, while no. you know we we the initial plan was was for this new industrial building. Um, the yeah the, the 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 project going forward is is entirely uh, the expansion of this gym of a um, recreational not, facility. Correct. Not not trying to um, have a, a mixed use or multi tenant building. Just in, solely focused on the expansion of the gym. And you have no basic site plans for us to reference at this point. No, nothing that that's ready for. And uh, you know I'm. <laughs> I'd rather not be in this position, but but we, we don't have them at, at this point. Um, I think that's something that we can get you relatively quickly. I recognize that we are at the Land Use Committee now, but um, you know, that, that's I mean, something you went, we can You provide. went ahead and quickly got certified to get this thing rolling. And I, you know, I it, it's just that I think that it's appropriate that we at least know what the programming of this use is going to be to be expanded. I mean, you talk about phasing also. That's another thing that I think would interest the committee and the community board, how long this will be, it will take to be recognized as a fully functioning recreation center for the community, if that's the case. I also wanted to know um, the membership fees. I her membership. What 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 are we talking about here? We're, and use of well, these sports. 
So Elizabeth, I can answer both your questions. As far as the, the timeline for phasing and everything, your 12 to 18 months would be a uh, start to start and you know completion. Then uh, we were a very modestly priced facility. We operate at $49.95 per month. Um, and that's our new rates. We were $45 uh, last year. Very reasonable for what you get. Uh, you know, you have 30,000 square feet of facility, you know, everything's state of the art, renovated. Uh, it's a beautiful facility. We encourage anybody with any concerns to, to, to stop by, like Phil said, announced or unannounced. It doesn't matter to us. I, I think that might be a, a just a good opportunity to um, just touch on what you guys have, have done in terms of renovations. I think also um, going as far as price uh, price wise, any in comparison to our competition, we're basically giving you double the amenities, double the services, double the classes at half the price. Yeah. Um, as far as what have you know, what does the facility offer? We have, again, we have weight training, we have turf, there's a health cafe inside the place. We do aerobic, um, aerobics room, we do Zumba, boxing, um, we have martial arts, we do HIIT classes, um, uh, meditation classes, uh, basketball, soccer, basketball, soccer, volleyball, um, every cardio equipment under the sun. We have spin, uh, spin studio, um, and I probably forgot a few, we have, again, brand new locker showers um like i said it's truly state-of-the-art phenomenal value facility um and if you go online you can read our reviews um you, you're welcome to visit our instagram page um I'm, again the the community has spoken and, and it's public information and it's available to everybody and so i welcome you to visit our site visit our google reviews um, you're more than welcome to visit the establishment. Um, announced, unannounced, it does not make a difference to us. Um, and like I said, Sal and I, we're local and easily accessible. If you have any questions, um, again, we, we welcome you. We welcome them. Call us. Come see us. Um, open door policy. Okay. I think what, what, you know, we're not focused, this committee isn't focused on membership, so to speak, the prices, et cetera. We just need to know what the programs are. But we're because that would also influence access, access to the site. And these are things that, you know, if you're enlarging your space and enlarging the capacity, there's also transportation, uh, you know, vehicular issues that we would look at with respect to the rezoning. Um, have, so, so this is why I was eager to get at the very least, a, a basic um, a site plan to look at, to see circulation and where things are going to be laid out uh, on the site under the new zoning. Liz, and we, I, I'm, I'm sorry to, to, I didn't mean to, to uh, interrupt. I, we, we can provide that. I just, I don't have them tonight um, within, within, definitely within a week. Um, we can get that to you. Um, I'll also note that, um, the environmental assessment statement for this project did analyze, um, you know, a, a, a much larger, much more intense use, um, which, which, you know, it provides a more conservative analysis and determined that there wouldn't be issues related to transportation parking or, or any significant impacts. Um, there were e-designations as, as we discussed at, at the last um, hearing related to uh, noise and hazmat, um, which are relatively standard, but there are no, with a more intense industrial use at the site uh, in a larger building, that there weren't any issues relating to um, uh, particularly traffic, but, but any environmental issues. Understood, but there are different uses here now with different traffic patterns, et cetera. So um, has, um, has your new proposed use been introduced in a new EAS? I saw that you had submitted a new one at the end of September, December. Um, so that that's something that, that we're currently working on with the um, our environmental consultant. We also have to consult with, with DCP on exactly how to do that. Um, I, you know, I, I see that, that Sarah and Derek from, from DCP are, are on yeah. the call. I think this is, um, it, news to them as, as, as it was to, to your office. So, you know, we, we've, we've got some work to do 
in that regard. Um, but we're um, doing the internal preparation and, and what we anticipate is that because again, this is a less intense use, um, we're, we're most likely looking at um, more narrative rather than um, you know, changes to the EAS rather than changes to um, the technical analyses themselves. Oh, I like the more narrative description. Can you be more narrative for the community board? <laughs> That's my hope. And, and Liz, I, you know, <laughs> I've, I've stood up before you guys a lot of times. It's my first time, you know, making a, a, a change like this. Um, mm -hmm. so I've never, I, in all my years in city planning, I've never seen anything like this. It's yeah. not a radical thing. It's not crazy. Right. But, <laughs> but I've never been in a situation. I've never seen anything like this after an application has been certified. So truthfully, I don't know whether or not we can come to a, a, a recommendation for the board tonight because of this. I, I, I don't know, the board, you know, I put it to the committee at, when we get into discussion. Um, I, 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 the one the one thing I, I will say, and I, I recognize that that's, you know, a, a question for discussion, but, you know, the we, we talk a lot about this, that, you know, what what we apply for, um, you know, is a zoning change. And, and ultimately right. the, the, the project is, um, you know, something that's, that's um, facilitated by, by the zoning change. And, and obviously that's, that's, you know, your board and, and the community have a, a, a very real interest in the project itself, but the, the zoning action does not change. And it's, it still has the same rationale that, you know, we've, we've got an underutilized site or a site that has the ability or, or the opportunity uh, to do more. Um, the initial thinking was that it could be do more as, as an industrial building. Um, and then recognizing that, you know, losing this, this gym was, was, you know, not the best, uh, you know, either business option or, or option for the community um, that's changed. So I'll, I'll wrap it up, but I think that, you know, ultimately the, the change to the project, um, is is still within the um, the rationale for the zoning itself, which is is unlocking development to potential at the site consistent with the surrounding area, um, and and allowing a um, you know a, a new business or an, here in this instance a large business at the site. I just want to add that also that I think, you know, a gym is more of a community amenity and almost a community facility, especially in the way that this team has um, expanded its use with community partners and nonprofits that utilize the space. So I think ultimately it's a better proposal at this point. So we'll definitely get back to you before your hearing on the 17th with a site plan and answer any additional questions that you might have in order to be able to assess this fully. Thanks. Okay. Kate, uh, Katie, uh, Evie, anyone? Jeffrey, any questions? Madam Chair, I have my hand up. Oh, sorry. Yes. Through the chair. Um, We've lost two health clubs, one right next to um, one of the schools where the school was frequently using the health club. Does your facility still have a swimming pool? It does not. It does not. That, no, was, a long, that, was, that, that was a long time ago. That is a possibility awesome. to be added in to the, to the rezoning. We, we've thought about it. We'd have to see where we'd locate it, you know, uh, but a, a pool was something that, that's been in our minds for quite a while. Um, at, at a minimum, we're going to be phasing in to where the old pool actually was located, the pool that you're referring to, um, a sort of a, uh, a health spa, which is would be part of the actual facility, which every member could use and, you know, which would have, you know, a hot tub, a sauna, steam room, things that were actually removed uh, during the pandemic because, number one, they were of completely poor condition. And number two, they were not allowed uh, to be used during the pandemic. But... We have since removed those, but our intention is to uh, reinstall brand new facilities right where that old pool used to be. Also, also you might want to know our community lost silver sneakers programs for the senior citizens, which a lot of health insurance companies cover, and the community direly needs silver sneakers programming. And as Richard had noted, 
Um, we are down on indoor soccer. So this might be something in your plans you might consider because it is sorely missed when the Astoria Complex closed. Phil, I believe we, we still take we we we, um, we do accept silver sneakers um, and we in addition to silver sneakers, um, we do our U.S. <laughs> which is the two organizations that do provide a subsidized membership. So if anybody's with Silver Sneakers, we do accept it. You're welcome with uh, with that type of... Yeah, I, I thought so. I wasn't sure. Yeah, so 100%. Florence said, I wasn't sure that they changed. Yeah. And um, as far as soccer, we have multiple children's soccer programs that, that play at the facility. Well, it would be good to, for you to define this very carefully when you come to the community board. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, other than that, Vince, can I just? Sorry, I'm I'm a little late in getting my hand up here, and sorry, oh, I don't Jeffrey, have my camera I'm sorry, on. Jeffrey. Right now, no, it's all right. It's all right. I just want to iterate that um, I I'm I'm actually happy to see um, kind of a more um, uh, defined program, and and happy to see that the gym is staying in place. I do think that there's a big need for that in our community, and specifically. Uh, I'm a dad of uh, two young kids um, and specifically kids like indoor kids programs um, are, are something that's lacking ever since like the Astoria sports complex shut down. So, um, you know, if, if it sounds like the expansion would include some things, um, some expansion of your programs, but also of um, maybe some, some additional programs and a swimming pool, I, I know it was just brought up and, kind of the reason I raised my hand here, a swimming pool is something that, um, uh, you know, we have one at the Variety Boys and Girls Club, which is great. And, um, my kids, you know, I take the kids there to swim, swim lessons and things like that. But, um, you know, that, that, is a, that is a big need, I think, for our community is, is another swimming pool option. Um, so if, if at all, to bring the swimming pool back um, to the complex, uh, that would be, that would be ideal. Jeffrey, we, we agree completely. I mean, the, the void of a sense, particularly Astoria Sports Complex. I mean, I, I've played there my whole life as a, as a kid growing up in Astoria through playing as a teenager and, and then some. Um, and we only found out they closed when the owner tried to, you know, he brought some members over to the BQ when we first, first took it over. But uh, we had no idea it was closing. But you know, with, with that void, there's only one place that has some soccer fields. It's on Steinway Street. That's the only place that has anything, but that doesn't service anybody who plays basketball, anybody who plays volleyball. It's strictly soccer. Um, and it's only turf. Some people like to play on hardwood. But anyway, um, those, are, those are things that don't, don't exist in the whole community board, in your whole community board. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if there's no one else, I'm going to close this and look forward to receiving your materials concerning the site plan and the programming of your propo new proposal. Um, and um, well, we will be discussing this, I guess, in the uh, business section, but I'm not sure we're going to vote on it tonight for a recommendation pending the information. Un understood. And, and we'll get that to you as, as quickly as possible, um, definitely before the 17th, but you know, I'm, I'm hoping to do so within a week um, and, or sooner. Um, but thank you for your time. Sorry to, to you know, uh, um, I, I, I think ultimately we're, we're, we're um, proposing a better project. Uh, it's just, it's, you know, um, apologies for the sort of whirlwind nature of, of um, introducing this change. We appreciate your, time and consideration and, and your patience with us. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you everyone. <laughs> All right. Um, before we go on, I, I want to take formal attendance, I guess. Um, is Sandy is not here. I know Jerry is not able to attend tonight. Um, is Tyrone here? Tyrone Gardner? I see Tyrone in the attendees. I'll move him up now. Okay, I'll come back to him so he can. And Amy Howe? Amy Howe is not here. Okay. Um, and did Andreas ever make it? No. Okay. But he had computer problems, so we'll see what happens. Okay.
Liz, it would be best if you did a full roll call so that going forward, it's on the YouTube record. Roll Hall is right. keeping track. Sandy, Sandy Anagnostu is not is absent. Uh, Jerry Caliendo is excused, uh, not here. Katie Elman here. Elizabeth Arian, I am here. Tyrone, are you here yet? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Evie Hansopoulos. Here. Amy Howe, not here. Richard Kuzami. Here. Jeffrey Martin. Here. Sam Masol. He's here. Oh. Sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. Here I am. <laughs> You're here. Okay. Um, and Andreas Miyast, not here. Okay. And Tom Ryan, you are here. Come here. I'm here. Right. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you all. We have a quorum. Adding three numbers together, subtracting some bigger numbers. Uh, Is that Jeffrey at. doing a math? Uh... Let's watch this teacher. <laughs> it's Katie's. <laughs> oh, it's Katie's. Okay, we're going to go on to the next. Um, the next uh, The next uh, item on the agenda is. I think I'm introducing Miss Angel Hart and um, Laura Rothrock. R Rothrock, um, both with the Long Island City Partnership. And here to talk to us about their expanding um, jurisdiction. So if you would like to begin. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Hi, I'm Laura Rothrock. I am the new president of the Long Island City Partnership. I just began in September and um, I've met some of you and worked with some of you in the past. Um, but for those of you I haven't met yet, I hope to meet you in person sometime soon. Um, and I'm joined by my colleague, Angel, who's the director of bid operations, as well as Charles Yu, who is our senior director of business assistance. And we have a short presentation about the bid expansion that we've been working on for some time. Um, before I came on as the new president of the partnership, I was working on this project. So I, even though I've only been here for four months, I feel like I can speak um, with authority on this. Um, so we will just pull up the presentation here. Um, <clears throat> so I think most people are familiar with what a bid is, but for those of you that aren't, um, a bid is when property owners within a defined set of boundaries pay an additional assessment on top of their property tax bill. Um, and instead of those funds going back into the general tax fund, they go directly back into the district. And bids are managed by a board of directors and they provide supplemental services within the district. Um, so as far as the Long Island City bid, it was created in 2005, which is the original bid, which is the North Subdistrict, sub which you can see is the darker turquoise color. And then it was expanded in 2017, which is the lighter green color. Um, it's managed by the Long Island City Partnership. So the partnership, we um, the the bid is we provide services within these boundaries, but the partnership provides business assistance and other services um, to Long Island City as a whole. So outside of just the bid boundaries, um, and we provide supplemental services like sanitation, beautification, visitor services, community development, and marketing. Um, and the North and South subdistrict, they each have their own service budget, but they sh have shared management and administrative costs, which provides economies of scale. Um, the assessment formula was recently updated, which I can talk about a little bit later. And the current bid has a total budget of $1 million for both the North and South subdistrict. Um, <clears throat> so as far as whenever there's a bit, whenever com a community wants to form or expand a bid, it goes through a public approval process. So it starts with a planning process that's out, and this is all outlined by SBS, the Department of Small Business Services. Um, so the planning process involves a steering committee that comes together to decide the boundary services, budget and assessment formula. And then once that draft is finalized, it goes into the outreach phase, which is where we are now. 
Um, planning, it, it, SBS says six plus months, but we've been working on this for probably over two years. Um, we kicked off the outreach phase in late October, early November, and we had four public meetings. Um, and the the public, we sent mailings to all of the stakeholders within the expansion boundaries, um, along with a statement of support, which I'll talk about a little bit more later too. Um, once we get, once we reach a, a certain threshold of where we're asking property owners and tenants to actually sign a statement of support, then the process goes into the legislative phase, which mirrors the Euler process, um, which is when we'll actually come to the community board for uh, a recommendation. We'll come to the committee for a recommendation and the full board um, for a vote. But we wanted to come to you now while we're in the outreach phase to see if you have any questions or feedback before we get into the legislative phase. Um, and also, sorry if my kids are, if you can hear my kids yelling <laughs> upstairs. Um, so the, the supplemental services that we provide now are the same that we are proposing for in the expansion area, which is retail support, coordination with city agencies, as well as the community board, um, supplemental sanitation, which includes sidewalks, cleaning, and snow removal. Um, we are proposing what's a little bit different is in the expansion area, um, some of the side streets because they have less foot traffic and fewer infrastructure needs like things like tree pits that we wouldn't they the assessment would be lower on some of those side streets um as well as graffiti removal maintenance district marketing beautification and winter lighting <clears throat> um so here is the map of the proposed expansion area um so the blue is the current bid and the orange color is the expansion area. So the portion that's in CB1 is along Northern Boulevard on the north and south side of Northern Boulevard. Um, and we go to the next slide. Um, this, is, this is the list of the steering committee members that were, were participated on the steering committee and are still participating on the steering committee um, now. And this is for for um, just the West expansion. We're also, sorry, Angel, if you can go back two slides. I should mention, we're, we, have a, a, we have a North subdistrict and a South subdistrict, as I mentioned. So we're also looking at expanding on the East side of Sunnyside Yards, which you can see here, which we would be calling an East expansion because that district is um, in I, the IBZ area and it's industrial, the needs are different. And so there's a different budget, there's a different formula. Um, it's not in community board one, but just so you're aware, we're calling that the, the East expansion and we're kind of considering that a separate expansion. So we've had separate public meetings for that area because it's different stakeholders and there, <clears throat> excuse me, there's no residents, um, there's no residential properties in that expansion. Um, so to kick off the planning effort, we conducted a needs assessment survey that was sent out to the stakeholders within the expansion boundaries and um, asking them what their top requested services are. And what was probably not surprising to you or to us was that the top five requested services are public safety, um, horticulture and beautification, traffic and transportation management, uh, advocacy with city agencies and increased sanitation services. Um, and then we just, we this is some of the positive feedback that we got from stakeholders in the expansion area that they thought it was important for us to undertake this effort to expand the bid. Um, and then here are just some photos of current conditions in the West expansion area that we took recently. You can see the trash along Northern Boulevard. That was a photo that I took just the other day. And the next slide shows in juxtaposition some of our beautiful bid services that we're currently providing in the bid. Um, we So within the current bid, we conduct uh, feedback and satisfaction surveys to the bid members every year. And this is these are results from the most recent survey, which was conducted in the summer of 2022. And um, as you can see, most of the stakeholders are satisfied with our services. They have long-term area confidence and the, they, they, they know who we are um, for the most part. Um, and so the budget that we're proposing for just the West expansion area, so 
just the expansion area that I showed you, not including the, the IBZ east of the yards expansion um, is about 300, a little over $300,000 plus the one-time capital expense and equipment for things like tree pits, tree guards, garbage cans. Um, <clears throat> and so the total budget that we're proposing is 375,000. Um, and then the way that that is, I think, I believe the next slide talking guess is the, the assessment formula. So this is a little bit confusing, um, a little bit confusing, but um, so I will try to explain it the best I can and happy to answer any questions. The way that it works is that the assessment is based on assessed value and square footage. So, and every bid assesses properties differently. And the, this, when the bid was established and when it was expanded, this was the formula that was established. And so we're proposing the same formula, which um, in the North Subdistrict, which is community board one, is it's 50% uh, assessed value and 50% of AV. So if you take all the assessed value in the, the district and all the square footage, and you divide it by the total budget, that's how you come up with the rate for each property. Um, mixed use properties, which are both commercial and residential, but only rental income producing residential, so not uh, individual condos, um, are assessed at 80% of the commercial rate, but for the whole square footage, both the um, residential and commercial. And as I mentioned, what is different about this expansion is that some of the expansion side streets were proposing that reduced rate um, because we think it would still maintain the same level of service, but wouldn't um, have to assess the property owners as high. Um, and also, I, uh, as far as tenants, so most, depending on the terms of the lease for commercial properties, um, most leases allow for commercial landlords to pass on the assessment to their tenants, but it depends on the terms of their lease. So ultimately the property owner is responsible for the, the assessment and assessments can be pro can be passed through to tenants, as I said, but they cannot be passed through to residents um, by law. And um, fully residential tax lots are assessed at $1 annually per R formula. Um, and 70, and the average assessment is um is under 2000 I'm sorry about $2500 and 75% of the property annual assessments are below $2000 and that's for our this is just for the expansion area um so going to the next slide the here is a map that shows those different rates so the purple is the current bid and the full rate is the main thoroughfares like Northern Boulevard, 23rd Street, Queens Plaza South, Vernon. Um, and then the reduced rates, you can see they're not in community board one, but the um, some of those, those side streets that we're proposing the reduced rate. Um, and then, so just as far as next steps, um, as I mentioned, we sent out a mailing to all the property owners and the tenants, our property owner list was, we're pretty confident in our property owner list because we get it from the Department of Finance and then also you know, through our own relationships. Um, the tenants are can be a little bit harder to reach. Um, so we've been relying on the property owners to pass along that information. We've been going door to door doing canvassing. We also have a tenant list that we have. It may not be perfect, but we've sent it out to all the tenants that we do have in our database. Um, and we also sent it to, um, I sent the information to, you know, we included in our website and social media. We sent the information to community boards one and two. Um, and then uh, in order to move to the legislative phase, which is what mirrors the Euler process, we need to demonstrate support from 51% uh, of the assessed value in the expansion area or support from 50% of all the tax lots in the expansion area. Um, and that's, that's a requirement from SBS. We would love to get support from both. Um, and then there's not a certain threshold that we need to get from commercial and residential tenants, but we need to demonstrate broad-based support. Um, and then we also need to collect letters of support from elected officials. And <clears throat> once um, that threshold is met, we'll go, as I said, we'll go into the legislative phase. And our goal is to provide services by summer 2024 because the legislative phase takes about a year to complete. And because of the 
fiscal billing cycle. We're hoping for July 2024 billing. Um, so currently we have, this is just in the, um, in the West expansion area. Um, we have 15% of commercial properties have signed the statement of support, 60% of the commercial AV, um, because most of the properties that have signed the statement of support have are the really large properties that have high um, assessed value. Um, and 16, we have 16 commercial tenants that have signed the statement of support and 64 residential tenants. Um, and I think that is the end. Oh, so we also have additional languages and translations available on our website um, on the expansion and the ballot is available in several languages. Um, so I think that is the end of our presentation. So I'm happy to answer any questions. May we have the screen back, please? Madam Chair, through the chair, before you go further, I have to disclose, I sit on the board of the Long Island City Partnership as district manager and a New York City employee. I am a non-voting member of this body. Thank you. Can we have the screen back? Let's see, okay. Let me just skip. Um, okay, Richard, you have a question. Yes, let me unmute. Hi, um, I guess I, I don't have a firm handle exactly on how the numbers are figured out here. I know it was a brief description and I had to sit down and figure it out, but um, it's required that 51% of the assessed value um, or the tax lots, um, if it is in fact approved, what happens with people that do not want and do not support this, they'll be assessed the um, the fees regardless, is, am I correct? Yeah, yeah, you're correct. So once the bid is signed into law, you can't opt out because the assessment will show up on your property tax bill. Um, so like any other property tax, you have to pay it. Um, and the city will, the city fronts the money to, the bid and then you know they collect the money um as they do with the property taxes so you can't opt out of it and so that's why it's so important that we make sure that we get feedback from everyone that's why this is such a lengthy process um there are there you know there's there's ways in the statement of support you can vote no in the statement of support um so but the the statement of support is is more of a mechanism that once you once you can get enough support, it goes into the legislative phase. If SBS is seeing that we're getting a lot of opposition or there's a lot of people that are voting no, they won't even let us go into the legislative phase because um, they SBS is real is the city agency that oversees this process process. And they just if there's not enough support, they're just it's just going to be a waste of time to go through the, the whole legislative phase. During the legislative phase, though, there are opportunities also to um, you know show up at the public hearings and. Um, at the city council testimony, for example, there's also um, within the bid law, uh, there is an opportunity to register a no vote with the city clerk's office, and that is during the, um, the legislative process. Okay, what... Um, um... Do you guys have to get recertified, re-registered? Is there a time limit on these authorizations? Is it something that you have to go back every few years and prove that you've done a good job or go back to the uh, to the people that are paying your bills? No, so there's not a sunset clause um, in New York State, which is the, the governing, uh, which is where the bid enabling legislation is from. Um, but we do have, so we are a public-private partnership. So we have... Um, the city council member, which is Julie Wan's office, um, the controller, the mayor's office, which is represented by SBS, and um, the borough president sits on our board as voting members. And then the community board also sits on as a non-voting member. Um, so, you know, and we have to provide audits and there's a lot of mechanisms that we, uh, where we have to um, have a lot of transparency and, and present to, the, to our public and private partners. Um, it's possible to dissolve a bid, but there's not, you know, there's not a, 
a requirement every so many years, we have to go through this process again. No, but there is oversight. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the committee? Tom, you unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, would you be a favor and go back to the uh, bid map, especially Northern Boulevard? Okay, can you hear me? My question is in the uh, Northern Boulevard sector, are you encompassing the Innovation Queens area and no. also the Steinway bid area? No, so the Innovation Queens is not in the district and the Steinway Street bid is not, uh, we don't overlap boundaries. Um, so yeah. But you're adjourning them? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, a question. Yes. Could Would you go back to that map that you just showed? Mm -hmm. I guess my question is, it's kind of broken, color coded, right? There's full rate, reduced rate. But if you're kind of a small business and you're being ex assessed at the full rate and you know, I guess I'm I'm trying to figure out how do you how do you come up with these determinations, and it just seems like it's a blanket area. So how do you differentiate between, you know, a a business that might be part of like a larger corporate entity and a small business? Yeah. So the we don't. That's the. I think one of the difficulties in this process is that we don't necessarily know the terms of everyone's lease, but. We assume that most of the commercial property owners pass along the assessment to their tenants. And so um, that's why it's important that we get support from the tenants as well as the property owners. So the, the easiest way to think about it is if uh, assessment is $2,000 annually for uh, a property, let's just say, and they have four tenants that are equally divided uh, square footage wise, um, then, then they would share a quarter of that $2,000 annually. So monthly, it doesn't come up to, I'm bad at doing math in my head, but monthly, it's not you know a lot of money, but it really depends on the specific terms. Most The property owners, um, there are some, to your point, small property owners versus larger corporate property owners. Um, and we want to reach all, we want to be able to reach all of them to get their feedback. Um, and we, it, it's interesting because some of the, that that 2000 number is an average but some of the really large property owners that you know they would be assessed like $30,000 because of the way that the assessment formula works and they and you know that's they still see value in that but the majority of the properties are 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 paying a lot less than that and it it works out where because the R formula is based on square footage, so the size of the property, but also the assessed value, which is based on the use. So if it's like a large, um, you know, rental with rental building with um, with commercial on the ground floor, or a large office building where they're getting significant money in rent, um, generally they're able to absorb those costs and they see value in that cost because those services are services that they need. Um, so we base the, the rate based on what the need is on the street versus on if it's a small business or a large business, because once we have this plan in place, it, if we were to go back and change the formula, um, we'd have to go through this whole process again. So it's, so it would be harder to say, you know, this owner would be paid X because that ownership could change or the business could change. Um, so it's, it's more based on the square footage and the assessed value and also the need on the street. And then you had given some numbers in terms of who you've gotten support from thus far. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so it says 16 commercial tenants. That's 16 out of how many? Um, I think it's only about, is it about like 10%? Angel. Yeah, um, sorry, I couldn't find the mute. Um, yeah, I think it's around like 200 tenants and a lot of those are, are commercial tenants. Like it includes 
office, you know, lawyers' offices and, and stuff like that. But um, yeah, we have about 10% right now. Um, and that's, you know, our, our kind of our main focus because it is uh, difficult to, to connect with small business owners um, and, and really tell them and sit down with them and inform them on this. So we have a, you know, a handful, like over 30 that we're in talks with that we're communicating this with and have showed their support, just haven't signed yet. So we're confident that that number will go up. It, it is pretty low right now, though. And then the 67 residential tenants, that's out of how many? That is a number we have to kind of guesstimate. It's a lot. There's a lot of big residential buildings, um, but um, we have dropped off and sent out the the mailing to the residential tenants. The residential tenants don't pay into the bid at all and they can't have a pass through. So, um, you know, we obviously want to inform them as much as we can, but, um, you know, we're, we're really focusing on on the commercial side right now. And then when you talk to the commercial tenants, they know that the landlord is going to pass the costs onto them, most likely? They understand that? or Yeah, we explain that to them. And um, a lot of the, the, so the retail tenants on the ground floor are a little bit easier to reach because we can see them. Some of the upper floor tenants are harder to connect with, but we've been relying a lot on the <laughs> property owners to help us connect. Um, so we've, we've been very transparent about what this means as far as the assessment and we'll show them what the assessment will be for their building. And then say, you know, if you have questions about what this will mean for your personal, um, for it, for a pass through that the landlord uh, would, would pass through to you, you know, please speak to your, the property owner. And does the landlord have to, um, if they're passing on the the fees to their tenants, do they have to do it according to percentage of the square foot? So it depends or is it on up the, to them to determine it, how. Yeah, yeah, it would depend on the the terms of the lease. So that's for their regular property taxes, but for this, does that? It's also whatever is in the lease. This would apply to as well. It's the same. Yeah, it would be the same as with the property taxes. Okay. Is that it? Evie, are you done? Thank you. Sam Masol? Could you? Two questions, easy question, hard question. Uh, easy question. How many businesses would benefit from uh, this expansion? <clears throat> And the hard question is, uh, with the number of businesses that would be benefiting from the bid expansion, how many jobs more or less do you think will be uh, sort of, um, you know, impacted by that, right? Because the bid expansion, I think, would hit uh, some of the manufacturing area along uh, Northern Boulevard, if I'm not wrong. Um, so as far as the number of businesses, um, Angel, what is the total number? It's around like it's around two hundred. Yeah, and as far as jobs, um, so the I don't know if there's any. Are there any manufacturing businesses? Maybe Charles might know on Northern. I'm not sure if there are. Um, okay, they may not no, be. Yeah, yeah. There's a few exempt, um, like government-owned properties on the on the north side of Northern Boulevard, but I, it's mostly big commercial buildings and, um, you know, the, a, a few of the storage facilities, but there isn't manufacturing. Yeah. And I didn't mention, so government and nonprofit owned 501c3 owned properties are exempt. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom, you want to unmute? Um, I'm looking at the map, the gray area, I assume is the Sunnyside Yards. Yes. If the one that area gets developed, will you be planning to possibly incorporate that into your expansion? Um, if we did, we would have to go through a bid expansion process again. So, you know, if it was, say it was a park, uh, <laughs> that would be a different conversation than if it was developed. So yeah, we would need to, depending on what was there, we would need to um, 
go through the whole process of the planning and the outreach and legislative process. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so Angel, is this something that you, or um, Sarah, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Laura. Laura. Mm -hmm. um, is there something that you need from the community board at this point, or is this just, um, and also when is you, when do you anticipate being able to come back? Um, We're hoping to come back in the spring. Um, it'll depend on when we meet those thresholds of levels of support, and then we can present to you the final data of how much support we've gotten. Um, and one other thing just to mention, when we we met with community board two as well, and they had said that some people weren't able to come to the, SBS wanted us to have in-person public meetings and some people weren't able to come or didn't know about it or didn't feel comfortable coming. So we're, we are gonna have one more uh, meeting over Zoom just for anyone that wasn't able to come in person. So we will send that information to Florence um, and she can pass that along. Um, but formally we'll come back in the spring, um, hopefully. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank um, you. Is there any reason why, why, oh, because there's no existing, I was gonna ask, is there any reason why you didn't go into the Innovation Queens issue, uh, you know, area? Um, and I would assume that's because they're not developed yet and there's no one there. Really yeah, to, yeah. To indicate support for it. Okay. Um, and also, uh, so primarily the bid is for um, it's a business improvement district, right? So it's primarily for the merchants and businesses. Uh, Innovation Q and S mostly is going to be uh, residential. So uh, we, it's you know, Laura mentioned earlier, residential actually you don't you know pay into the bid, so you know, it's, uh, it, uh, it it doesn't make sense to expand into those areas. Okay, so so you largely deal with um, buildings that are dedicated to commercial use rather than mixed use buildings. Is that the case here? Well, no, not necessarily. So the um, the city used to not allow residential assessments, um, but they do now. Um, but but they're the residential. We find that the the it's easier for like a business to absorb the costs of the bid versus you know an individual residential owner. Um, the originally this the Long Island City bid didn't have mixed use of uh, mixed use um, properties in their formula, and but because of the changing nature of Long Island City, it made sense because the larger buildings like the larger towers that had a lot of residential and ground floor commercial were bringing the most foot traffic into the district and creating the most garbage on the street but then they weren't paying into the, the bid so it doesn't make sense necessarily to assess uh to include um buildings in in the boundaries that aren't going to be paying in but are going to be benefiting from the service and so that's really the the reason why we have this mixed use formula. So it's really both. We target the commercial and the mixed use. Okay. I just, because, because the Dutch kills area is um, rife with new buildings that are mixed use and we're getting rezonings every several months in that area. So, um, you know, the nature, like you said, the nature of the area, the character of the area is changing. So mm -hmm. they repeat what, services what, that the what? community board office does. Don't forget everything that they do, the community board, the district office does. Okay. So all of the sanitation and everything that they're doing, we advise them as being on the board. So residents call our office for all the same services that the businesses are getting from their offices. Mm -hmm. And one thing I'd like to interject, too, is that uh, as far as Innovation Queens, it's much more in the proximity of the existing Steinway bid. Definitely. So it would make no Thank sense. you, Richard. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's a block away from the, the local bid that we've had. Actually, our Steinway bid was the first bid ever created, and it was founded by Julian Wager, a former board member. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to um, move on at this point. I want to thank you very much for the presentation and, um, you know, look forward to hearing 
um, seeing this when it comes through ULERP, I suppose, is the next phase mm -hmm. we're looking at. Okay. okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Um, let's go into the uh, business section at this point. Um, I'm going to open, first of all, let's see the minutes you received this morning. Um, are there any corrections, changes, um, additions? Are there any objections to accepting the minutes? There being no objections, they are approved. Minutes are approved from, what was it, December 7th. Uh, 2022. The next item in that portion of the new business is the um, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway rezoning. Um, Smith, yes, Tom. I have to disclose that my wife is employed by Aikerman LLP, so I have to abstain from the vote if we have a vote. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, I'm opening for discussion. Hmm. What do we do? Ladies well, and gentlemen? No, go ahead. Um, in general, I think it's a, it is a community asset. I, I don't really see anything down the road that would cause me to change my mind personally. I can't speak for anyone else. Mm -hmm. But if it did come for a vote, I would vote in favor of it right now. Um, I just think that it, particularly because of the uh, losing a story of sports complex, I just think it's an important facility to have in the area. So um, uh, from that standpoint, I'd like to see more, <clears throat> more concrete plans, of course. That's, that, is the, that is the main issue. Um, but the use in general, I think, is a positive. That's my thoughts. So if if we did decide to vote, well, then I wouldn't, I would not be against it. If you don't, I totally understand. <laughs> you know. Okay. I, so I, oh, I was just gonna, I was just gonna add. I, I think I agree with with Richard. Everything you said for the most part. The only thing I, I would like to see plans before we before we have a vote. You know, I, I just feel like it's kind of an incomplete. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they presented the information that they had. And like, to me, it was all positive. Like we, it's a community asset. We need, um, you know, uh, gyms in the community. Um, we need more space for courts and we need, and hopefully they can get a pool in there. And, uh, you know, we need these things in our community. These are community assets, but, you know, without plans for, you know, without floor plans and without understanding how parking is going to work. Um, again, I know these are things that we're not necessarily um, voting on in terms or we're not, you know, um, they can, they can present this to us and then go in and change everything. Once they get the zoning, I, I do understand that, but I just feel like there's an incomplete part of the, um, of the um, item here without having plans. So, uh, you know, I, I would move to like table, um, until we have those further plans and and I know we don't like to meet prior to uh, like at the at the board meetings I know we don't like to meet as a committee but um, I, I don't know how to resolve it but I again I just feel like it's kind of an incomplete well item. we you, you know that Jeffrey we do the the report to the community board um, that explains what we've done here tonight so, um, I mean, we, we can do a report without a, um, uh, without a vote. We can do sort of a consensus explanation of what we come to at this point. Um, and it would be up to the applicant to make an effective presentation to the community board to let them, uh, you know, make their own decision. Um, Evie, you had a, your hand up. Yeah, I think um, it's, you know, we, we require it of anybody who comes with any kind of zoning change. It just seems odd to me that we would then say it's fine if you don't have a plan. So I'm more worried about like process and, and precedent. And then, you know, who's to say someone else could then say, well, you know what, 
they didn't have to do it. You voted. Why should, why should I, if it's just mm-hmm. a minor change? So, you know, I think the project itself is fine. I don't object to it, but uh, again, I, I do not want to vote on something where I, there's not a site plan. So I, I, I agree with you, especially with the push by the city now to push things really through without community review at this point. And we're talking about something that's okay, relatively okay. And, you know, they're talking about doing away with review for large rezonings. And um, no, I agree with you. I, I think there has to be a minimum laid out that they have to present to the community board and um, um, in, they have to do some work before um, I think the community board can um, support it. So perhaps we should, uh, uh, Tom, you are taught, you have your hand up too before I make any further statements on it. Yeah, what, I just want to comment. I live in the area and I can't vote on it, but uh, the area is really manufactured. Down there in the residence, it's really off the beaten path. I I can't see anything that the um, applicant could do that would uh, greatly impact that area. Everything is industrial. It's off the side of the BQE. It's there's no residential areas there. Um, I don't see. Yes, he has no plan, but I don't see anything that could uh, impact that area that would not be beneficial. So just putting my two cents. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's worth four. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) How about a nickel? (laughs) Okay, got that. Um, Okay, so why don't we just outline the things that, uh, oh, Evie, you have one more, you have another thing to say? No, I just forgot to put my hand down, sorry. Okay. Um, so why don't we outline what it is we need? I mean, I'm saying, and they think they, they, I think they know that we require a site plan um, and a program for what's going to be happening within the space, the new space that they're talking about, and also a, a, a basically an access and traffic plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, because this is not something that you walk to. This is going to be drawing traffic to the area. Um, Although, as Tom says, it is not an area that will be impacted, so to speak, because it's distributed across the the 12 hours or so that they're open. Um, There's no real, I don't, except after school, maybe. Um, I'd like to know more about their philanthropic um, approach. You know, they did have a list of schools, et cetera, how they do this. Um, I know it's not zoning, but it's programmatic. And so um, just like to a little bit more familiar with it. Um, I'm probably pretty sure it's fee-based. You know, they're not- I'm sorry. On, It's fee-based. It's fee-based for sure. And what the fee- The based- schools don't have gyms in our area, Liz, and this is common that they rent out the space for the schools to use the gyms. And a lot of these are after-school programmings that parents would want their children to do. So you pay to go there. My Hmm. children, when they were very small, went there frequently when they did have the swimming pool. And they had excellent services back then. It was run down, though, but now they've upgraded it far much better than it was. And I stayed away because of the adult entertainment facility over there. I didn't bring the kids over there because of that. That Um, place never was a problem, just so you know, never. Okay. So... um, I think I think they're aware of these things. Um, anything else that you want to include? Nothing. Then fine. So, um, what? Nothing. Okay. All right. So the consensus here, the report will show that there's a consensus here that there's not that it's an acceptable use. We just have concerns about some of the way it would function, um, but that's you know not a zoning. But the zoning change itself is not an issue um, because of the lack of impact it has. Um, what else? I'm trying to rationalize this at this point for the report. Um, 
Okay. So may I just have consensus, hands raised, that that's acceptable? And Tom cannot vote because of his right. affiliation. Okay. Correct. Right. All right. And we uh, do we have any other board members, I mean, committee members, or have we lost everyone? You're full. You have 15 people on this call. You just can't see them all on your screen. Okay. Tyrone is there. Okay. Oh. And can you all raise hand and I can read your hands to Elizabeth to use the raise hand function? I Katie have, Elman, I have, Jeff. Katie, I have. Jeff uh, Martin. Evie, I, one moment, I'll tell Ev you who I have. Katie, Evie, Richard, uh, Tyrone, Jeff. And is there anyone else we have? Um, Tyrone, did Tyrone vote? Did you say you had Tyrone? I have Tyrone. I have one, two, okay, so three, you're good. Four, five. Okay, five. And then Tom is a conflict of interest. Okay. Well, he's not allowed to vote, yeah. And myself. Sorry. So that makes six. Okay. Good. Okay. All right. So we have a consensus that this is the acceptable way to go. And that will be in the report to the commit to the community board. Okay, and I, uh, for those who Mr. Sinecori and Frank St. Jock are still here, you've heard our comments and we hope to see that information within a quick turnaround, with a quick turnaround. Two weeks. Uh, two weeks. No, faster than that, Tom. Faster Frank, call me in the office no, tomorrow. Good. Frank, call me in the office tomorrow. Okay. Will do, and, and we're all we've already got our team working on everything. So hopefully it'll be okay. much much quicker than two weeks. Um, but I'll, I'll call you, Florence. Um, thank you. Afternoon. We'll talk about it. Yeah, well, well, I greatly you. appreciate it. The uh, general meeting is in a couple weeks, so you know it's the twenty. Yeah, it's the seventeenth. Right. My goal will be to have it to you all before, so you can study but, it. What we'd like to do is send is send the site plan with with a letter, which outlines the operational um, questions that you have. And the yeah, but we're going to need blueprints. Yeah, don't, yeah. Don't the site plan it. and you know lay out and so you can okay. see, and you know, have the information, so it's so it's clear. So you, you substantively you have everything in front of you. Okay, I'll talk to Frank tomorrow, Steve. Okay. Um. The, okay, I just want to let the the committee know, or those of you who are still here that um, the planner, Joy Reeser, who was from city planning is moving to HPD at this um, tomorrow actually. And um, in her place uh, in on an interim basis, Derek Jasmine, I don't know if, yes, he is still here. Um, and um, we had Sarah Avila this, after, this evening also, but she was just um, taking this application through Euler. Um, I want to welcome them. I welcome Derek on a permanent basis, interim permanent basis. So um, we'll be in touch. If Derek, if you can just send me an email and so we have contact. Um, okay, I don't have anything else. Is there anything else other than adjourning? Oh, motion to adjourn. Jeffrey, wait, Jeffrey, Jeffrey oh. has stand up. Jeffrey? Oh, Jeffrey. Sorry, no, no hand up. No to... hand up. <laughs> I had my hand up from before. Okay. I'm dealing with the I'm dealing okay. with bedtime. Sorry. Can we take Jeff at that second? Jeff, you want to second that? I'll second. Sure, sure. I'll second that. Who, who did who, who did it? Was it Tom? Tom made the motion and okay. every volunteer to second. second the motion. Thank you. Thank you all. Happy New Year. Happy this New Year. Year. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thanks. See you Happy soon. Happy New Year, everyone. Yes. Uh.
Okay, Brandon, um, we can shut down.